right, we're back, everyone. Welcome back to the Steiger International Apologetics for the Global Ooh. Youth Culture event. Uh, I thought you were about to say Steiger International Center there, like you suddenly thought we were all we're somewhere else, Kugis, Germany together. Yeah, the lockdown has ended and we're all together. Not yet. Someday soon, hopefully. Um, let's get started. Put your name and where you're from in the chat so we can start to see the people represented from all over as people continue to log in. I do have two shout outs I want to make because I know of some groups that are watching together. Uh, I want to do a shout out to Equip Bible School in Cyprus. So uh, we got a group of students from Cyprus that are, wow, are watching. Cyprus. So what's up, Cyprus? That's awesome. Yep. And uh, also Friendship Church in Minnesota, USA. Uh, we got a group of people watching there as well. I will be with you afterwards. So I'll that see is so you funny that you're driving to them straight after this, Aaron. That exactly. is that is awesome. It's a weird you got to keep your Saturdays fun, packed, yep. packed with fun, don't you? Yeah, and we're actually going to do outreach at the University of Minnesota uh, this afternoon. So Brilliant. lots of good stuff for me. Hey, Aaron, did you did you notice me dancing in an outreach in that last video? Did you spot I, that? I didn't, and I don't want to see I, that. I had either. some pretty good moves in it. No, you should, okay. Next time All that right. video comes up, pay attention for that. I'll try. All right. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Aaron Pierce. I am the host to, for today. Uh, I'm the mission director for Steiger International. And once again, with me is Luke Greenwood, our Greetings, European people. director. So, uh, great, yeah, great to be with you. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just a quick reminder, our heart is to reach and disciple the global youth culture, young people all over the planet, influenced by similar voices, living similar lifestyles, having similar worldview and, and views of morality. And this event is all about addressing the most relevant cultural objections facing the church today, particularly as it relates to the global youth culture. Uh, we are active as a mission in over 100 cities around the world, building our teams. We're in Europe, the Russian speaking world, which includes uh, parts of Central Asia. We're operating in the Middle East. We're doing new things in East Asia, all over Latin America, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, and in North America as well. So no matter where you are, and we've got people connecting from all over the world, uh, there are many ways to get involved. In fact, at the end of today's session, uh, we will have a debrief discussion, uh, a follow-up for each specific region where you're going to be able to debrief and discuss and meet people from your region. So uh, in the chat right now, I'll put it now so you can see it. We'll do it again at the end as well. Uh, we have a, a, a document that you can click and see where uh, there's basically a, another Zoom link you can click and connect with people from your region. So make sure at the end of the call today, you connect with people um, and go join this call so you can debrief and connect in with people in your region. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention, uh, if you're interested in learning more uh, about Steiger and in particular reaching the global youth culture, uh, I want to recommend a number of books to you. Uh, we have several great books uh, in our mission and I want to highlight a few of them. Uh, the first is Rock Priest, mm -hmm. which was written by our founder, David Pierce, who the also happens to be my dad. Yep. And this tells the story of Steiger, how the mission came to be. And, and our story beginning in Amsterdam and growing into a worldwide mission through a band. And that's the cool thing about our mission is our band, our mission was started ultimately by a band. So it's a, a punk cool band in the 80s. Punk band in the 80s, that's right. Uh, and then we've got two other books I wanna recommend. Uh, Jesus in the Secular World written by Ben Pierce, which addresses how to engage secular culture. Uh, very helpful, relevant book. It's also available as a small group video series online. So check that out. And then finally, this book written by some guy called Luke Greenwood uh, called Global Youth Culture, which is all about understanding and how to reach this global youth culture. This book actually just came out in Spanish. 
yesterday. For all our Spanish-speaking friends, you can get a copy of that. Thank you, you to Alison, Viviani, and a couple of other people from the LATAM team who worked hard translating that. I'm so excited. Thanks, guys, for bringing that out. Yep. So there are many ways. We're hoping that this event is just a springboard into long-term work in engaging this culture. Um, and we, we want to see it happening all over the world. So we're excited to have you with us today. Now, let's transition then to the topic for today. Um, if there is one topic that is challenging the church more than any other, it's the issue of sexuality. In fact, many young people have rejected the church because of this issue. And, and it's ironic, and we discussed this last week with Justin Brierley, but in a world of moral relativism, the, the traditional biblical view on these issues is actually seen as immoral to our secularized culture. And many perceive those who hold to these views, these traditional biblical views, as haters and bigots. And so we've got that going on. And then on the other hand, the way that some within the church have treated the, the LGBTQ with condemnation, disgust, and just a lack of Christ-like love has exasperated the issue. So how can we respond to these tough issues in our culture? How can we point people from, from these lifestyles to Jesus? How do we hold firm to biblical truth while still treating all people with grace, love, and dignity they deserve for someone made in the image of God? So that's why I am so thrilled to invite our guest today. Our guest is David Bennett. He is a writer, speaker, and passionate apologist for the Christian faith. He's from Sydney, Australia, although I believe you are in London now in the UK. He is pursuing a doctorate in theology at the University of Oxford. He holds an Oxford postgraduate degree in theology, as well as a master's degree in analytic theology from University of St. Andrews, Scotland. David wants to bring a fresh new voice to the issue of homosexuality, cutting through the current cultural war we are seeing. And we'll talk more, but he has a book uh, called A War of Loves and uh, other resources. And you can find that on his website. We'll put the link in the chat now. Um, but David, so thrilled to have you here. Welcome to our apologetics event. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Aaron. It's such a pleasure to be here. And this is what the book looks like. You know, when people talk about this issue in the Christian world, Often the covers are really drab and boring. And I decided <laughs> I want color. I want yes. life, the God we serve. So Perfect. here's a war of loves. Um, yeah, just for people to see it. Awesome. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm just really loving this like international global vibe. This is really fantastic. Having been locked down in my house in the Oxford UK for you know the last year, it's just nice to feel the global vibes. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's thing. Good. It's a yeah. beautiful thing. Well, David, could you start us off by, I think it's a, to really personalize this and to share your own personal story. So we have some context um, through yeah. that. So could you start by sharing your own personal story? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting because I never really wanted to write a book until I was much older and you're kind of afraid of writing a book on something this colossal and this important for people that is so personal uh but i just felt the lord just constantly pushing me and saying you know david the the way that i've saved you isn't just about you it's a message for others i have a message for the church in how i've saved you in your testimony and so my story is very much before there was like a woke movement before there was this kind of you know, youth culture of intersectionality um, and this mass deconstruction that was happening culturally and doctrinally in the church. I was actually uh, kind of in the atheistic gay world, you know, grappling with my sexuality, raised in an agnostic home, but went to a Christian school. And so 
I was one of these people that like made the opposite direction <laughs> journey from kind of secular atheism and being a gay man into becoming a born again Christian. So I went the other way, whereas a lot of other people left Christianity and deconstructed it and said, I'm going to go live this other way. I went the other way. And so I think what the Lord is doing is using that story to show that there's another way to the kind of polar binary narratives we have in our media of either you're Christian and you're homophobic or you're secular and you're actually so liberal and you love everybody. And that kind of just breaking that down, actually showing that's not a true binary at all. And um, it hasn't been in my experience. And so I'm just super excited to, to share that with you. And, you know, I wrote the book because I wanted a gay person that was an atheist to be able to understand why Christians had different, a different view and a Christian that didn't understand a gay person and why they made the choices they did to like really grapple with that experience and understand how deep it is and how hard it is to, and to not let people kind of get away with a simplistic picture of each other that leads to kind of hatred and division, but to learn how to res mutually respect across those boundaries whilst having differences of opinion. And so that's why I wrote the book and I, I'm hoping that that can help people in their contexts. And I, I really did actually write it centrally and I'm doing things like this today, centrally for gay people to say to them that Jesus loves you and Jesus wants a relationship with you. And he has a path for you that you can't imagine that is unexpected. And so I called the book, The Unexpected Story of a Gay Activist Discovering Jesus. And that I really think God has an incredible call for all people, particularly gay people. And he's really given me some meaty revelation <laughs> through my experience being saved in a pub in a gay quarter of Sydney at the age of 19 and now 32. So it's been a long, long journey and I'm still working out what it means to be a Christian, still very much just starting my journey <laughs> as a disciple. Um, and so I come to you today with that kind of humility of I'm also still working this out <laughs> and this is my story and how I've come to a place of peace with God about my sexuality. Yeah. And so, um, Aaron, would you like me to just yep. go into a time of testimony yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Could you, I would just, can, cause for us, I think for a lot of us, this is an issue that is one of those like cultural things or a tough question we get and, but it's not a necessarily a personal thing. And so I'd love it if you could just share your own personal journey of how you met Jesus and where absolutely. you were at before and how you came to that place. Cause I think that would be really helpful for us. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, so whenever I do a session like this, I like to share a personal hashtag, which I enjoy seeing around the place uh, in online context. And that, that, that personal hashtag is hashtag fabulous made glorious. Uh, and you know, it's a difficult one to translate, so I'm sorry for people <laughs> that are translating. Um, but I chose this personal hashtag for a reason. I think it's because, A, it makes every gay person feel so much more comfortable. It's like, oh, he understands. Um, but also because I think we've done something to the gospel that is just a little bit off. I think we always talk about how broken and fallen and terrible we are and we're sinners and you know all of that and I, there's truth to that absolutely not want to deny that for a second but we have lost the fabulous side of who we are as humans that there's also we were created very good in the beginning that we have desires that are meant to propel us towards god and towards goodness and intimacy and relationship and i think sometimes when we talked about being gay all we talk about is you're such a bad sinner you're so terrible, you know? um, rather we need to hold the picture together. Gay people are still made in the image of God, just like straight people. Gay people are still a fallen and sinners like straight people. Like, mm -hmm. But there's a difference in that experience. There's a little bit of fabulous that just needs to be embraced in the church, that gay people have a special role. That doesn't make them better, it's just special. There's something different that we go through. And we also experience our fullness and our sinfulness differently in some ways as well. And so that's why the fabulous bit. But then 
The gospel does, doesn't Does leave. the fabulous word like uh, mean something like very specific for the for the gay community? I mean, yes, in the sense that like when I'm with another gay person, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. I see you're fabulous. Like you know, okay. there's this kind of like it's a word they use just, a lot. Oh hi, like you know, like mm -hmm. it just it just cuts that like relig falsely religious thing that I think sometimes we as Christians can fall into. And then made glorious is kind of, God doesn't leave us in just the created good and just in the fallenness. He takes us into something even greater. Mm. He takes us something into something that's so amazing where I want everyone to just imagine for a moment, a world where everyone loved each other perfectly and had a perfectly loving relationship with God. Like imagine that world, what would that even be like? And then once you imagine that world, it's kind of difficult to do so. You realize that if you only focus on the fabulous, if that becomes the whole part of your identity, the whole thing you're focusing on, you're going to miss the glorious. And the question is, how do we take our created goodness and our fallenness into the glorious? Mm. And so, you know, I, my story is very much one where I went from everything's about the fabulous and who cares about the glorious to one where I haven't deleted the fabulous, but I've reoriented the fabulous in the glorious and we need all of those aspects um, of of understanding the gospel and sexuality um, and so i'm going to share that story now hmm. so c.s lewis himself said i have no answers anymore only the life i have lived and i think that was you know the one of the greatest apologists of the christian faith says that himself <laughs> i have no answers anymore and I think there's something about sexuality and desire, particularly, that pushes us to a point where we just, it's a mystery. And that doesn't mean we don't know anything about it. It doesn't mean that it's not important. It doesn't mean we need to, don't, shouldn't ask all the questions about it. But we are confronted with a shaking in ourselves when we have to ask the question of sexuality and desire. And it's interesting because in science, which is another big topic, a lot of people when they first do the natural sciences become atheists. And actually the, the father of quantum physics, um, Werner Heisenberg, when he first started out as a scientist, he became an atheist because of it. And he talks about how, when you take the first sip of the glass, the first gulp of the natural sciences, you think there can't be a God. like evolution all of this there's no way of like reconciling the two and then he says at the but if you keep drinking the glass at the bottom of the glass is god there staring at you wow and i actually think as i share my story i want to frame it that way that when you first start asking the question of lgbtqi plus it can be so confronting it can be so difficult for the idea you know idea of having a faith and reconciling it but I want to encourage you that as you take the deeper gulp, God will be waiting for you. And so in my story, that's true. But the testimony and the story is so important in how we roll that out, how we do that. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, they overcome the enemy through the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and loving our lives, not as to shrink from death. And so I think in the Christian evangelical world, we've been very good at overcoming the lamb, uh, sorry, overcoming the enemy through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, just telling a story. But there's a third element from just me telling my testimony now that I also want us to really have in the back of our mind in, in our hearts, which is loving our lives, not as to shrink from death. What does that even mean? <laughs> that is intense. This scripture in Revelation <laughs> 12, 11 is basically be willing to die for Jesus basically be willing to take up your cross and give up anything for this messiah sell sell the field you know hold the precious pearl and sell everything else for it that's the invitation of the gospel it's not just to preach and, and have a story and receive grace and the cross it's to come and die and be resurrected yeah. so i want you to have that in and i think the reason we struggle with sexuality is because we're not willing to die all of us have to die, straight or gay. And so that this is my journey of learning to, 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 to do that. So it says in 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. 
Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You will often hear, and I heard as a young gay person in my teens, love is love. The problem with love is love is that is what we call a tautology. It doesn't give you any information. It cancels itself out. That love is love. Well, that doesn't define love for you. Whereas we know in scripture that this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That is the essence and center of what love is. Wow. Sexuality has to wrap itself around that first before it's given its true meaning and it's actually freed to be a source of intimacy. And so that's the third thing just before I start the story is I want us to really take that to heart, the deeper aspect of what love really is. Love isn't just an affection. It isn't just a rush. It isn't just, you know, I see someone attractive and I fall in love with them. That's not what love is essentially. That's part of love. It can be part of love, but it isn't essentially love. And so there I was as this young 14 year old raised in an atheist home, searching for real spirituality, searching for the love that is love, <laughs> looking for the thing that we're all created for. But I heard at the age of 10, my own Christian uncles one night in the family room making homophobic comments about gay people. And I knew at that age, somehow I was that person. And I internalized those comments as a form of self-rejection. And I thought, I'm not welcome in the Christian community. Mm. Now, the late Henry Nouwen, who is a, a celibate Catholic priest, and he was himself gay or same-sex attracted, he said, over the years, I have come to realize that the great, greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power, but self-rejection. Success, popularity, and power can indeed present a great temptation, but their seductive quality often comes from the way they are part of the much larger temptation to self-rejection. When we have come to believe in the voices that call us worthless and unlovable, then success, popularity, and power are easily perceived as attractive solutions. The real trap, however, is self rejection. I find myself thinking, well, that proves once again that I am a nobody. My dark side, side says, I am no good. I deserve to be pushed aside, forgotten, rejected, and abandoned. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice of Jesus that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence. Now that's a long quote, but I just think it's so brilliant in explaining what I was going through at the age of 14 with my sexuality, is that what my sexuality presented to me was a great temptation to reject myself. And the thing is, the progressive liberal world is very good at saying you shouldn't reject yourself. Those horrible, hateful Christians, you know, get rid of them in your life and go and enjoy your life. You're free. Just go and have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whoever you want to love. It's fine. Absolutely fine. And you're rejecting that self-rejection. But what that world didn't teach me is that by embracing that kind of false freedom, I was actually still a slave to self-rejection. I was still spending my whole life trying to reject self-rejection. And the mm. irony of that is that I was still controlled by it. Wow. And in myself, I built this angst and this anger and this like, really deep bitterness towards the church and Christians hmm. and that drove me into a kind of persecutor complex because I was still controlled by self-rejection if I was really freed from it then why did I need to persecute the church couldn't I just let the church have its rights to think its way and I could go along you know living my way and we just respect each other but because and I think this is a much deeper element and we get stuck in 
an abstract conversation. So as a 14 year old, I was dealing with that question at my Christian school. Wow. Science couldn't tell me why I was gay. And yet the LGBTQI world literally told me I was simply born that way. However, when I looked at the science, that's not what science said. We don't know why two to 3% of the population is gay. We don't know that we're born gay. It's a mystery. It's somehow a like complex morass of things come together to produce this sexual orientation that seems to repeat itself in two to 3% of the population. I'm not born gay, but being gay is certainly not a choice. And that's really complicated. And that doesn't fit into nice, neat narratives. Christianity to me was what oppressed women and LGBTQI people. And in many ways, we must face the history that we as Christians sinfully have. But I was later to discover Jesus never did. Love is not the idolatry of romantic attraction we've made it. Love is ultimately grounded and defined by God's sending of Jesus dying on a cross to reconcile us to himself. That's very different to the picture of the God that I thought existed that hated gay people, that cruelly created them this way and then punished them for something they never chose. What kind of horrific God would do that? That is not a God I want to worship. And I just as passionately don't believe in that God today <laughs> as I do, as I did back then. Mm -hmm. I met a different God, the God of Jesus Christ. So there I was one afternoon kissing my boyfriend in a park. And I had, I had like had this long conversation with him about religion and Paul who wrote the um, epistles in the Bible and women and gay people and how I could never support Christianity. And he kind of pulled this little cross out of his back that <laughs> he had for some reason felt he should give me. And he put it in my hand and he said, David, I want you to have this as a gift. I'm like, why would you give me a symbol of our oppression as a gift? Like, <laughs> I do not want this, you know? <laughs> and so I went on this rant about this cross and he just kissed me to shut me up. And I obviously found this incredibly romantic. And so I didn't stop him from kissing me. <laughs> and as he's kissing me, a man pulls up on a motorbike and he takes this large stone from like a garden bed and he throws it about 10 yards over towards my back and it hits me in the back and wins wow. me. So <laughs> I'm like, you know, like this. And I remember this like searing pain just kind of going through my back and I smell the, the smell of petrol as this kind of homophobic man rides off on his motorbike. Mm. And in my hand was this cross. And I thought to myself, that man, that homophobia, was produced by the, this cross. Mm -hmm. And I will dedicate my whole life to being a gay activist that destroys this Christianity that produced that homophobia. And I used Christianity as the explanation for homophobia. But what I didn't realize is in that moment, prophetically, God had put a cross in my hand to say, David, I took those stones of homophobia on the cross for you. Wow. I'm with you through my boyfriend, Vladimir, <laughs> the age of 15, God had actually placed that there. And so if you look on my book, I've got a like little cross just down here that's dangling and that's that cross. And I put that on the cover because I thought that's so incredible. They, then they, I went to a psychic with my token feminist friend. We were sipping out soy chai lattes in, in an alternative suburb of Sydney about a year later. And I, I just really still have this yearning for spirituality. I want something, but like, I think there's a psychic down the road. Let's go see the psychic and get our tarot <laughs> cards read, you know? And so she's like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. Like wonderful, you know? And, and she dyed her hair black from blonde as a statement against the patriarchy. And you know, I was like this young queer, you know, professor type that was gonna, you know, write books and whatever. And so you can just imagine us sitting there and so I go to this psychic and she reads my tarot cards and at one point in this meeting she stops the meeting she says oh, you're a child of the light you're destined to be with Jesus the greatest mediator in the heavenly realms you're wow. going to become a Christian and I was like 
can I have my $20 back? I like, do, like, do you know who I am? Like, I'm a gay activist. Like, I am going to destroy Christianity with my life. You're clearly deluded. Like, give me my money back. I kind of stormed out. I was so angry at this psychic. And so I went back to the cafe, got another soy chai, sat with my friend. And she said, well, David, maybe you will become a Christian. And I was like, mock my words. I will <laughs> never become a Christian. That religion is like to blame for all of it, you know, and kind of, you know, and so we had this, this exchange and I've actually met up with her recently. And it's, she's like, I remember when you said that to me, <laughs> look at you now. Like, you know? huh. um, so really amazing just how there were these glimpses of God's love and his chasing after me, subtle and sometimes not so subtle glimpses of the love of God. And then I got to university and I'd been through a lot of existential questioning about the nature of reality. And I was really like not happy with superficial atheism or left-wing politics was pretty empty when you got involved. And I was looking for something more and I just couldn't find it. And I had written this question, what is love in my journal at one of those like alternative clubs, you know, where all the intelligentsia of people, cultural industries are, and they're usually pretty, empty spaces but I thought I might as well see what people said and you know I got what is love baby don't hurt me don't hurt me no more wow wow you know so many times in this journal that's what I received as a response to the question that I'd hand out handed out this club so I remember being in the taxi and just saying I'm over this I'm over this superficiality like there was no good answer in those pages and it says in Ecclesiastes you know God has placed eternity in our hearts and you know until we receive that eternal love from god like our hearts are just restless they just can't find the thing that we were created for mm. and so there i was and i ended up um, at a pub in central sydney now three months before this i had a debate with my uncle you can read about it in the book where i told like told him there was no absolute truth he was a christian kind of pentecostal my cultural enemy and had this debate and I said, there's no absolute truth. You can't communicate absolute truth through the language. I've studied postmodern, you know, philosophy. It's not possible. And he leant back to me and he said, well, you just said there's no absolute truth. And that, that is an absolute truth. And you just communicated that with language. So you just doubly contradicted yourself. <laughs> um, and that was like quite frustrating, you know, <laughs> and I kind of got up right. fabulously and stormed out of the room and did the gay <laughs> activist thing and just told him he was like, irreprehensibly prejudiced and bigoted and how dare he ever even stand in my presence um <laughs> it's like shut down and what about all the women and what about all the gays and what about all the other religions and what about hell but within me as c.s lewis said if i find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy the only logical explanation is that i was made for another world there was still in my hearing him speak to me this like part of me that secretly kind of wanted to agree with him, but I just, you know, the, the desire problem was still there. No matter how woke before woke was woke, I was <laughs> like, that remained. And I ended up, he actually, he was in the car with my aunt after that debate. And he said to my aunt, I see the Holy Spirit over David and he's going to be on's time like he's going to become a christian he's very close and my aunt was like did you just are we experiencing the same human being like there's no way he's <laughs> going to become a christian <laughs> um and he was just like no three months time mark my words he'll become a christian and three months later i end up in this pub in central sydney and there's this filmmaker there and this is such an incredible encounter a life-changing encounter for me with this girl and she was totally not what you expect of a Christian. She was really involved in creative industries and filmmaking, all this amazing stuff, working with people with different disabilities and representing them in film. And there she was. And I had such respect for her that she got her film into the largest short film competition in the world. And she was a finalist. And I was like, what an incredible person I've heard about you. And I want the interview for the student magazine at university. And so I start, walk over to her and, 
And um, so like, how did you get this film into the largest short film competition in the world? Like, how does that happen? Like you're 19 years of age, like that doesn't happen when you're 19. And she's like, well, yeah, do you want the real answer? I was like, of course. And she was like, it was God. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like throwing up a little bit in my mouth <laughs> she's like oh yeah well yeah like god like jesus i'm like mm, great <laughs> you know i'm like mm, great okay good for you yeah well that's really good that that's your truth great yeah um, it's not mine yeah um and she's like just like well what do you think of jesus and i said well wonderful man but like you know if anyone is going to be God, it's probably him, but it's certainly human invented religion that he's God. And like, you know, I, I, I like Jesus, but no, like I'm gay. I've read one Corinthians six, nine and Romans one and Leviticus 18. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks so much. But um, you can keep that, you know, whole part of your life to yourself. Hmm. And I love her response to my angst. And I think this is quite profound. It's just talking about the self rejection problem. I think what God saw in what she saw through the power of the spirit was that I was still controlled by self-rejection. I actually kind of wanted the truth, but I didn't want to reject myself for the truth. And she could kind of intuitively sense, and she was a charismatic Christian speaking in tongues, tithing, going to worship concerts and music and all that stuff, you know? So she's living a life of quite set apart holiness. And, but yet through that holiness, she had an intuition about my person. And I'd never seen that in Christians before. It was such a beautiful, unique thing that she had and a real spiritual gift of mercy. Mm. And she was able to reach into my life with the power of God and asked me a very simple question. And that question was, have you experienced the love of God? And that's not like a really impressive, apologetic like question. She didn't explain homosexuality to me. She didn't really have any idea herself. She was straight, cisgender, like she's not probably up with the kids on everything, you know, about that. But she just <laughs> asked this question, you know, that like struck me. Wow. And it's like, I was just somehow like amazed. And she's like, David, I don't usually do this. Like, this is crazy, but I feel the presence of God right now. And it's so strong. And it's like overwhelming me. And like, he loves everybody, but like, he really loves you a lot like a lot wow okay <laughs> you know she's kind of like manifesting in the spirit and i've never seen anything like this like my school was a calvinist frozen chosen we love our calvinist brothers and sisters but like i never seen like the power of god just i don't know like it was amazing anyway and there was just something about her and and so she says can i pray for you and i'm like I would never let anyone pray for me, like not in a million years. And I'm somehow there like, okay, yeah, well, I'm a good agnostic. Like you can pray for me, but I don't think anything's going to happen. Like it's just going to like be good, good luck, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I still had this, this sass towards her faith and it was kind of weirded out. And a voice in my head was like, she's a crazy fundamentalist, get away from her. And another voice is like, be intellectually honest. Like you have no idea whether God exists or not. So just let her pray for you. <laughs> Oh, wow. and so as we're sitting there I said yeah you can pray for me like I don't think anything's gonna happen and so like she I she like kind of puts her hands on me and I'm like well what is this I've never seen anything like this you know and she's like with the Christian prayer of the century like in the name of Jesus by the blood and power of the lamb I just wow. pray that every evil spirit and every darkness yes. leave and like, I'm like okay i like this oh, it's a bit spicy you know <laughs> like hello like <laughs> and um i've just never seen anything like this and like most people will probably be scared off at that point but i loved it but it was also like not sure at the same time but as she's praying for me i'm like kind of like i don't care i just this seems legit and somehow there was an authority she had that just spoke into the darkness over me. 
and as she's praying for me I just feel this like crazy weird amazing hovering over my head and if you think of Genesis it says the spirit hovers over the waters over the chaos you know my life was a bit of chaos you know um and and there the Holy Spirit was just coming like down over me like this as my uncle had said exactly three months after I had had that debate with him March 25th 2009 it was December 25th 2008 that I had the debate with my uncle. So just crazy when you think about it. This prophetic wow. word was being like fulfilled in the in the midst. And I heard this voice as this like amazing sensation went over my head. And it was like someone pouring oil over my head. And it just felt like, you know, King David says in Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil. My name is David. Also says in the Psalms, I've anointed my servant David with my sacred oil. So this is happening going, this is the most incredible thing I have ever experienced spiritually in my life. Like, what is this, you know? And I'm like, in this, I just suddenly hear the voice of God. And it's like, do you want me? Three times. Do you want me? Do you want me? Like, very straight. And in that question was the most incredible humility that I've ever heard in my life. It wasn't like I am telling you who you are you have to do this like I'm forcing it's nothing like that it was such a deep sense of equality like, almost like you know you're looking for someone to date and you're like wanting that equality you're wanting that you know it was like that sense and that's what I've been looking for my whole life and just something about the voice just I was like yes I want you and you know I'd been trained in postmodern philosophy and everything I'm like ready to like question wish fulfillment like I am ready to question that Freudian construction of daddy to get some love like I am <laughs> you know I'm not just saying yes to this out of mere assent or desire like there was something profound that happened in that moment and then I saw a veil over my heart and a pinprick of light just piercing the darkness over my heart like a thick veil and it says in 2 Corinthians 3 their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand but whenever someone turns to the Lord the veil is taken away now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and that's exactly what happened in that moment is that light of faith coming from God just pierced through the veil like one of those old school you know, conversion paintings in a museum. It was exactly like that. <laughs> this little like, <laughs> and then I felt this like <sighs> breath enter me. And I said to her, I'm breathing without breathing. And she's like, you're being born again. Hallelujah, <laughs> praise Jesus. And I'm like, but I'm not a right-wing American <laughs> born again Baptist. Like, please, you know, like, what does born again mean? Like, you know, I'm freaking out. She's like, it's amazing. Like you're breathing, like the spirit and the air of God and his breath and like all this stuff. I'm like, I have no idea, um, but it was amazing. And then I'm there and she's like, let's just keep praying. I feel like there's more. I'm like, okay, amen. And, and, um, maybe not amen at that point but at least now i'm like amening um and as she's praying for me more i hear this voice say will you accept my son jesus as your lord and savior and i am telling you like the spiritual tension in that moment was so intense it was just like i was being pulled between two voices and two ways of understanding things. And there was this one voice that was like, get away from her, this is crazy. Like, but I knew that voice was coming from darkness. Somehow I could see because I'd been born again and illuminated to God's presence and reality, that what darkness and light was. And I think that's one of the most amazing gifts that I was given in that moment is I knew what was from darkness and what was from light. Mm -hmm. And so I, and this other voice saying, David, this is real. This is me. You know, I am God, like come into my love. And I just knew to choose light. Why would you ever choose darkness? Like, why would you do that? And so it's a very simple, like, 
not intellectually like complex realization of like, why would you stay with the darkness? And so in that moment, I said, yes. And I became a Christian, you know, in a kind of official way. It was like crazy. I said yes to this question. And like God had evangelized me directly. It was crazy. <laughs> and I like walked out of that pub with her and like the love of God had been poured out on me so intensely. Like my body was burning and she had to get like a flannel from the bar and like wipe me down. And this is all happening in the gay quarter of Sydney, like right in the thick of it, right near Oxford Street and Surrey Hills. Like you don't get any more gay than that. Like <laughs> it was right in the middle of it all. And like it's just amazing how God met me in that place. And, you know, and I went home that night and my mom was waiting up and my mom had become a born again, spirit filled Christian three years before this and I hated her for it. And there was a rift between her and I, and I'd said, you need to choose between the real son that's standing right in front of you and the delusion in your head that hates me and wants me to go to hell for something that I never chose, you know? And my mom would always say, I don't need to make that decision. I, I refuse that, that choice. And there I am walking into the house at 11 PM, kind of like shaken to the core, like what has just happened? And I'm going to have to eat my words. So I walk in and I'm like, hi, mom. Yes, yeah, been out. Mm -hmm. She's like, are you okay? And she's heard about this prophetic word from my uncle. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I just don't think I, I think I just, like, <laughs> I think I just became, I became a, I be became a Chris, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah i knew he was the god of the impossible my mother's an opera singer so like the projection is just powerful and she starts doing this like praise dance around the house and she's like i made a covenant with god that if he saved you i know he's the god of the impossible because you were impossible to save and oh my gosh the prof wow. prophecy has fulfilled itself and i'm just like you're like that girl in the pub like what is happening you know and she's like She's like, oh yeah, like we, we knew this was gonna happen. Like your uncle got this word from God like three months ago that you would be saved. Wow. I was completely gobsmacked that my mother knew this was going to happen to me. And so I like, I went, I went like basically to my bedroom hearing that there was this prophetic word. And then my mom was like, you're gonna have to call your aunt and uncle. So like, I'm not just saying this. So I called them and found out like everything and was just so amazed. I went to sleep that night and I ended up speaking in tongues in my sleep. And like, it was so amazingly intense. And you can read about those experiences in the book, but it was just incredible how God pursued me. And I ended up at the film competition three or four weeks later. And I was looking up at a star in the sky and all my queer friends at uni all my LGBTQI plus friends at uni all thought I was nuts. Like, but some of them kind of liked what had happened to me. And like, you know, I used to buy sushi rolls for my breakfast in Australia. Yeah, it's a bit weird, but that's <laughs> what we do. And, and like, I would give them all to homeless people. Like, I would never give my sushi rolls to homeless people. Like, this is like a clear evidence that something has changed, like fundamentally <laughs> um, to, to my inner person. Like, <laughs> I, you know, I was wow. sitting on like park benches and like the presence of God would show up and I'd be like, go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> like, and then I was like yeah. preaching to my friends. I'd be like, it's just a free gift. Just don't worry about your sexuality. Just receive it as a free gift. Jesus has done it all. You know, I'm saying all of this. The, the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in our hearts. Like I didn't even know that I was quoting scripture, like mm -hmm. verbatim. <laughs> I didn't even know the Bible. Like it was amazing. And, and I think about that period of my life with such fondness and so I was at this film competition and a lot of my career friends would be like, David, are you sure this is because, you know, you're just kind of making up for the fact you don't, haven't found the boyfriend yet. You know, this is kind of a replacement. <clears throat> so I was starting to deconstruct, starting to question it. And I looked at the star in the sky and I was like, I know that was so real. Like, I cannot explain what had happened to me. And I'm new, I'm different, I'm changed. Like, who is this person that I am now? And it was like, my heart and my mind could not, like they were like in a battle against each other. And that's why I call the book a war of loves 
because I had the mind of a gay activist, right. an atheist gay activist, but my heart had been fully born again. Wow. And so it was the head heart journey, you know, of Jesus making us whole and healing uh, deep, the deep places of our soul. And that was happening, but I was still struggling to believe, like still struggling to believe, still no reconciliation between my sexuality and faith. And um, I just was there at this film competition and the girl that prayed for me won the whole film competition. And I looked at a star in the sky and said, if you're really real God, I need a sign from you that I need a rational thing because this is not enough. Otherwise I'm, I'm a gay activist. Like, what do you expect? Like, I need a lot more than this. <laughs> so I was just really honest with him and I I ran down to the red carpet to congratulate her and she comes over to me there's Kate Blanchett Jeffrey Rush all the famous people what I didn't know at the time was that that film competition had been organized by Hillsong Christians and that they had prayed that a secular film competition could lead to salvation for people and there I was basically like being saved at this film competition and she was there and she comes over to me and she says, David, this whole event is like for God's glory. I'm just his servant. There are angels everywhere. I've won. It's amazing. I can't believe it, but it's not about me. It's about him. And like, I just, you need to know that he's real and that he exists. And God has been bugging me all night to tell you that. Hmm. And I just like left <laughs> the film competition, kind of like floating home because it was another moment of just, the undeniable love and reality of God in Jesus and I was a Christian and I went to the same church as her that Sunday and found out it was the same church as my aunt my aunt, mom in my uncle and my dad also got saved after I was saved which is all just so amazing so that's how I became a Christian maybe we can kind of pause there um yeah. wow. uh just before we do that I wanted to read a scripture um in Isaiah 56, it was written 600 years before Jesus came, and it says, Let you, no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who che choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And then in Isaiah 53, which is the prophecy of Jesus's death on the cross, it says, talking about his suffering, who has heard of his generation, question mark. In other words, where are his kids? Why is he not procreated? Where is his wife? And I think these are really deep passages that show us the good news that God has for sexual minorities that aren't necessarily gonna live an easy life of kind of heterosexual marriage with kids. He says, 600 years before Jesus even comes, I'm going to give them a name better than sons and daughters, a name better than having kids or having a heterosexual marriage. He says, I will give them an everlasting name. He doesn't just do that and have a nice promise. He, may, he fulfills it in his son on the cross who becomes a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And so what we see here is the name that was given to LGBTQI plus people, eunuchs, is actually... <laughs> Jesus's name and we see in Revelation 14 it says there's actually 144,000 no Jehovah's Witnesses you're wrong it's not talking <laughs> about you <laughs> it's talking about the eunuchs who are, are faithful to Jesus that they will be able to follow the lamb wherever he goes they'll sing a song that no one else knows which is a sign of intimacy and warfare in the Old Testament and they'll have a name that no one knows that God will give them and so God has this incredible honoring of people who are LGBTQI plus like me, but who chose to trust God and give that to him in celibacy and say, yeah, I'm not going to go down the path of marriage. I'm actually just going to give you everything. And he says, well, then I'm going to give you a name that's even better than that. Wow. And I think we see that Isaac Abraham exchange that I had to go through in my own journey where I offered up my Isaac. <laughs> I gave my sexuality to God and, he said, "Why? Right, I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you the name of the eunuch in Isaiah 56. So that's how I've come to live now. And I'm sure there's a million questions, but I wanted to focus <laughs> on the testimony because it is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, guys. David, Maybe wow. we can have a quick... Yeah.
chat. I'm yeah. blown yeah. away. Well, I'm seriously, so blown away. That was such a powerful story, David, and yeah. so incredible and encouraging and illuminating to us. To, to us. Uh, there are many questions and we're going to have some time. We'll take a break. But David, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for your your story, the, your, the truth in your story, the power of, of God displayed through your story. It's just so encouraging, man. So yeah, encouraging. You. It is. And and uh, I mean, I, I was in tears a number of times as you were talking there, David, and the chat is on fire. People are, are just uh, thanking you here. I mean, for me, that was one of the most amazing behind the scenes yep. view of the exactly the kind of people that God has put heavily on our hearts as a mission yep. to love and to go to yep. Yep. and to hear that perspective of yep. what is going on inside um, yep. is just so powerful. The way you told it, giving us that detail of what God was speaking to you about, how you were reacting when a crazy Christian was was preaching at you is so cool. And yeah, I, I love it. It's so relevant to what God has put heavily on our hearts. We had I've had like a number of the leaders of our mission writing messages yeah. to me. Can we get him at our mission school? Can we get him on our podcast? You yeah. are impacting us already. So yeah. thank you. Totally. Totally. My pleasure. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> it's just the story is a message, as I say, and when I first became an evangelist, the prophetic image that God gave me was that I was a chisel, a golden chisel in his hand to break down the wall of enmity between the gay community and the church. And so right. any way I can do that, <laughs> I'm trying. So <laughs> well, yeah. that so was, I mean, especially what you shared at the end for me was yeah. one of the most powerful yep. and clear perspectives of God's perspective of um, somebody who is gay and 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 how you know just a hope in it that is yeah. something i haven't heard before to be honest so it's just thank so you. powerful mm. thank yeah. you we, we, i think there's the third way that's deeper and so much of the world and the church is just trying to stop us from finding the deeper path of jesus and so on so many issues so i'm just so i feel so blessed from the Lord to have been given the revelations that I have to be able to walk that deeper path. So thank you for welcoming the testimony. Yeah. Well, we're going to, what we're going to do, because we want to go further with this and we've got questions and, and just more conversation and dialogue. We're going to take a little break to allow people to put in the questions. So in the chat type in, in all caps question, and then write your question. We're going to, you know, curate those questions and then bring those to you, David. Um, but man, just, so encouraged beyond unbelievable it's so cool so let's take a 10 minute break thank you david we'll be back with the questions and we'll keep this conversation flowing so thanks guys thank you all right welcome back everyone uh man that that was amazing david thank you Welcome, welcome back. Uh, we've got a whole long list of questions to get True. to. Um, there's some great questions, by the way. Uh, people, yep. great job sending in good questions today. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, maybe thank I'll you, just, everyone. Yeah, may, maybe I'll just start it just with a general um, thing. So many of the people on this call are connected to our mission, Steiger, and our heart is to reach, essentially to reach young people that would not walk into a church. And certainly those that have at best an, an apathetic and maybe all the way on to an, a hostile view of Christianity, which certainly you came from that space. And many in the LGBT community find themselves in that hostile space. Our heart, if our heart is broken for, for people and we want to go and reach them, where do we start? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't have your story. Um, most of us don't. Right. So right. can you just give us uh, some advice from your perspective, if our heart's breaking for this, how do we start engaging people? Um, can you, yes, please speak to that. I think it's a really fantastic question. It's so complex. I think every individual person's story and journey, like it's hard to 
give a formula, but I think you can give ingredients, you know, to an approach to LGBTQI plus community that is about effective hospitality, intellectually, spiritually, um, relationally. I think one of the really big things that is missing from a Christian response to these questions in general is to understand the problem of suffering. I think, and also the gay understanding of these desires, like the, the mainstream secular understanding is like being gay is fine, it's wonderful, everything's just good. But that's not the experience of gay people. You know, the experience of gay people is that they have this irreconcilable attraction that just like appears and then they're like, what's well, not to the opposite sex? And there's a lot of grief in that because you can't just go on ahead in your life and just have a family and kids and do the normal thing that everyone else is doing. And you have to ask some pretty intensely profound questions. And so when Christians come along with like these explanations for sexuality and they're like, well, it could be abuse in your household. It could be all these other like psychological things. And they've said that in the past and some of that's been pretty dodgy, you know, to use an Australian term, <laughs> it's pretty like, inadequate and sometimes even damaging and there's been things like conversion therapy like oh why did we ever do that and like you know like why did we not just say here's the gospel why did we not just mm. say suffering is a mystery that jesus helps us with and your sexuality isn't just suffering it's also a gift and so i think if we can understand sexuality with that lens of this is a form of suffering and it's a mystery mm that God has spoken about, but not in a way that gives us this ultimate authority to explain it away. Yeah. And to say like, I don't know what it's like to be gay. I have no idea what that would be like, but my gosh, I know that Jesus's company is the solution that Jesus's incarnational presence in the Holy spirit is a thing that can help that person understand that mystery and, and actually look deeper into it and then find a vocation of obedience. I think if we can look at it that way, rather than trying to explain everything so fast and try to have every answer and come at it with a kind of humility, but a confidence in Jesus, I really think gay people will respond to that. I don't know one gay person who isn't really interested in the gospel, actually. You know, I know a lot of gay people. It's just they've been so hurt and they're so done and they're like, I can't come back to that. Wow. And I think wherever we can trying to defy the stereotype that they have in the head of in their head of us and there are a lot of cultural scripts that we can fall into we're either like the broken record everyone's going to hell and they're all gay people are terrible and or we're like everything's fine god loves you it's all explainable just be a christian it's like this is hard stuff yeah. and this is deep and this is going to take time but I just love in my story the confidence that that girl in the pub had right. in God to answer that for me, even though she didn't have all the answers. But I also think it took from me faith. And that's yeah. the mystery is faith. It's we're saved through faith. And I just knew to hold on to Jesus no matter what. And that just brought me to a certain place. And I think that is actually the solution to everything. Like even with the blind person, you know, they, he's born because of his parents' sin, you know, born blind or like all these explanations, Jesus is like silent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he's blind so that the glory of God can be revealed. And I think that's just the answer of God is the glory and trying to get gay people to experience that glory in their situation rather than giving them some very human broken kind of, explanation um, i think i think yeah. one thing you said that really struck me and maybe just in a, adding to what you just said i haven't necessarily framed it through the lens of suffering and of mm. course in our day and age suffering is often something we don't want to talk about and there's all sorts of weird teaching <laughs> on, on on suffering right and and i guess framing it through the lens of suffering doesn't make it an us versus them because we all suffer, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. And so now, listen, I'm not looking at you as, well, wow, you, you're dealing with something unique. We're all suffering. And mm. 
you know, there's still choices there. There's still like, we don't want to make it somehow we're not responsible, but I think it creates what you said earlier about this gift of hospitality or mercy. And I think that's, that's such a powerful thing that almost supernatural mercy that you spoke of. Can you talk about how we can, how we can offer, what is, what is that hospitality that you spoke of look like for someone like me, who's not, doesn't come from that background? I think, I think seeing your own suffering as a gift. And I think if like, often as a celibate gay man, like I really struggle sometimes in certain kinds of Christian contexts, I feel the least at home. But when I'm with Christians that have suffered and Christians, whatever that suffering might be, especially a lot of black Christians or people from different ethnic Christian backgrounds, I find I belong with them so much easier because it's like they've gone through stuff or they're somehow, they're not running away from suffering. They're like, we have suffered and we've brought that to Jesus. And even in like black gospel music, you can hear that sound, you know, of I bring my suffering to Christ and I'm not hiding it, you know, or like that opens up a space where someone can kind of trust you with deeper ultimate questions, you know? And so I think seeing the first thing is to see your suffering as a gift don't run away from your suffering. See it as a way to identify with others. So my aunt is amazing. You know, when I was first going through all of this and I had a boyfriend and I was still pro-gay marriage, like not everything just changed in my testimony. I was still quite liberal in my view of marriage and thought the church should change and that gay people were committing suicide because it wouldn't change its view on marriage. And I had that whole paradigm, you know, but people just kept pointing me to Jesus and she would just say to me, but you've got the Holy spirit now. And all I want is for you to let him show you what is real. And the Holy spirit will never contradict the scriptures. Hmm. And it's, it's really fascinating how she didn't take the Bible and show me everything and then be like, bye. <laughs> you know, she said, I did. I have no idea what it would be like to live with my Bible as a gay person, because those verses don't concern me. That just like really helped me. It was like, she was taking me seriously. She wasn't trying to explain me away because I was threatening to her faith. It was like, I know Jesus is true. I've gone through enough suffering myself. As a mother that loves three children and seeing them suffer and all the other things I've gone through, like, I know I've trusted him through some storms. Like he's going to show you the way. I don't know what that's going to be. And you can't, you can bring your boyfriend to church and you're always welcome here. And even if you don't align your view on gay marriage with us, like we're going to be with you and we're going to journey through that. And we can't let you be a leader because that's, there's like this, but like we're up front, but like we love you and we want you here every Sunday and we'll give our lives for you. <laughs> it's yeah. just like yeah. kind of that kind of thing that mercy, that love, knowing it through your own suffering, seeing, having, re, staying really intimate with how Jesus has done that for you and then extending it to others. Um, and I remember her saying one other thing because she used to be really horrific with me before this happened. And she said, you know, I came to a point where I really had to practice what I preached. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that I was just preaching and I wasn't practicing. And preaching without practicing is wor worse than just just keep your mouth shut like <laughs> sometimes less words is better you know this kind of like attitude and so yeah and I think that really helped me to open up the bible to kind of start to trust it and then I'd say the other thing that was really what's so interesting now for me just quickly with the bible is that the verses about homosexuality have actually become my favorite verses in some way, because in Romans one, what Paul is doing is he's kind of coming at these people called Judaizers. And these were people in the early churches saying, Gentiles have to be Jews. They have to get circumcised. They have to look like Jews to be saved. Like Jesus is not sufficient. We have to add something to it. And they have to like kind of become like us. And Paul's gospel was like, that's absolutely not true. Jesus saves and like Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. And so there was this kind of fight going on in, in the Roman church when he's writing Romans 1. And he writes the stereotypical Jewish critique of a Gentile. That's a non-Jewish non person. And, and he says, you know, brings up the false worship and this, the gay sexual activity and the like, all the things that 
Jews would are commonly use as like a kind of explain the Gentiles away, they're all going to hell, where are the chosen ones, right? And so to kind of be prideful over them. And he like builds this up and he doesn't disagree with it. He doesn't say that it's theologically wrong, but he then turns it in Romans to on the Judaizers and says, but you do these things and you are twice worthy of judgment for them. Mm. And so I don't think we've read Romans one deep enough. I don't think we've really understood what Paul was doing. It was quite radical. It was saying you're worse than the gay people, the Gentiles, yeah. the, <laughs> yeah. you know, sorry, I just had a block there. Yeah, like there was like, you're worse than them. And he's turning that critique back on them. And I think sometimes with homophobia as Christians, we need to do that. We need to turn the homophobia back on itself and really rebuke that. And then the second thing is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where it talks about this word, arsenokoites, which is a transliteration of the Hebrew um, that was then translated into Greek in the Septuagint, which is the Jesus's Old Testament. So he would have read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of, of the Jewish text. We have a Jewish apostle trying to translate the gospel to a whole bunch of Gentiles. So he's using a Greek, Greek language as the Gentile language to communicate, right, to, to the Gentiles. And he's saying, using the word asenokoites, which means ma male better. And it's from Leviticus 18. So it's pretty clear in scripture, like this is what, this is not okay. And it says, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, you can't do that action. But he chooses a word that's not an identity word. He uses a word that's an action word. And he yep. coins this word. Yep. And he says, some of you were like this, as in you, you indulged in that, <laughs> you did that. But now you're washed and waiting. And what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 now means to me, it used to be a clobber passage. It used to be a passage that made me feel so condemned. And now I'm like, no, like this verse is a sign that the early church was full of gay people, <laughs> you know, and full of people that were wrestling with the question of same-sex desire. And they were all embraced and all included and all given the free gift of salvation. So we see this like radically inclusive God through these passages. Yeah. even though they do morally instruct us in a certain direction. So I think just coming, I think that's one of the big things we have to do to answer your question with hospitality is like, come back to the scriptures afresh, start to read them more radically, like take off these old conservative, liberal, whatever political things we have, get rid of that, come back. Like how radical is Paul? What is he really saying? And get a deeper education on the scriptures and then when we see gay people, we know that, of course, they're going to be part of the church. Of course, God has radically included them back then. Why wouldn't he now? Just like I did with the eunuch passage. You know, you see right. 600 years before Jesus, God is saying, I'm going to include the gays. I'm going to include the transgenders. I'm going to include, you know, intersex people. Like, that just incredible, like, sense of his inclusion that he's going to accomplish through Christ. Yeah. And just letting that soak into us again and like getting rid of that old mindset, yeah. I think is really, really important. Could you, could you quickly speak to, cause I think for, for us that are not in this space all the time, it's the issue of identity mm -hmm. versus like my, my actions. And I think, you know, even the question of is having same sex attractions or, or feelings of, of, of same-sex attraction, the same as now identifying myself as a, a, as a gay person. Like, is there, is there something there that we need to separate or uh, help explain that concept a little bit? So I was actually in Oxford and Timothy Keller had come to town and Lovely. I was feeling a little bit sassy, a little bit, I got a little bit of attitude under my, you know, I was like, mm, Tim Keller, I like him, but is he really going to meet us, you know? <laughs> and of course, it's like, I love Tim Keller, like, <laughs> but I was still, so I put my hand up with all these Oxford students around me. And I said, should Christians stop saying that um, being gay is not your identity, Christ is? That was my question mm -hmm. to him. So I thought, well, I respect him deeply. So I'm hoping he'll have a good answer. And he said, absolutely, they should stop saying that. But here's why, he said, because any aspect of a human identity is important to discipleship. 
And to be a disciple doesn't mean you erase all of your identities. It says that you demote them under the lordship of Jesus and that they get reinterpreted around the lordship of Jesus. So I'm still gay. I still, I'm very attracted to men. Like it's real. And I'm just not that perturbed or like, it's fine. (laughs) Like, I'm not, there's no culpability in that. I didn't choose that. Of course, if I lost, there is. But like, there isn't a culpability in that. I didn't choose to be gay. And that's okay. And it's, I'm called for a very short period on earth to give that to God and to like enjoy intimacy in friendship and in other ways and to like reform the church so that it is living in the way Jesus did. And by the way, Jesus was celibate. He wasn't married. And he is the life, greatest life of intimacy ever known to human beings. So the idea that I have to go and have a gay marriage to flourish is completely false. And I actually think you're freed when you realize I don't have to get married to be whole. Mm. That's incredibly liberating. Mm. Not that marriage isn't a beautiful thing when it happens in Jesus, but like the whole lie that I'm not complete until I meet someone romantically and the idolatry of romantic love that's not Christian and it's not humane. It's cruel. Like sometimes you just don't meet someone. (laughs) Sometimes life you're single, like why should you have to be married? And like the Jewish people really, you know, struggle because their salvation was linked to procreating and having marriages and Jesus didn't. And like, do we even understand how radical that is? Mm. I don't know. So these are some of the ingredients, as I say, some of the teaching we need to bedrock into the way we approach sexuality and the lgbtqi plus community and there, identity. there was actually there was actually a question from the audience that relates to exactly what you were just saying from sana amoa and he asks mm-hmm. do gay christians stay single always is that always the case uh, yeah. how would you speak into that such a good question and like i think it's such a like vital question i think that we need to rearrange how we ask that question Right. I think it's how do I get to honor Jesus with my life? Oh, yeah. Not does a gay Christian get to do X or a straight Christian get to do mm. Y, but how have I been especially given the capacity to honor Jesus? And if that's in heterosexual marriage, great. And by the way, many gay people I know have their sexuality have ended up in very crazy circumstances finding an opposite sex partner and they their essential orientation has not changed they're still gay (laughs) still talk about the fabulous together but there's like there's um there's this like incredible attraction that god just by grace it's like a little green shoot that grew up into a tree and then they're married and they've got kids and that happens for some gay people and they, their orientation doesn't necessarily change. But as my friend Sean says to me, I'm not, some days I'm really homosexual, but other days I'm just very Gabby sexual, <laughs> just attracted to my wife more than I am to other men. And actually that's not that different to heterosexual men that struggle with attractions to other women. So once I've never had that, but I'm open to it. So I think celibacy is the default for any Christian And yes, I think there's a way in which for gay Christians, it's more complicated than straight Christians because we don't have an innate desire that just easily like goes towards the created order. We go through a grief that's deeper and needs to be understood. And so it's not as easy for us to go into that heterosexual marriage. There's a whole bunch of other things we have to take into account. But I think that's why it's so important to be able to identify as gay or say we're same-sex attracted so that we don't go and marry a straight partner and live a lie you know like that that's all open out on the table and if god calls for it and it seems to be yes a bit rarer for gay people that are christian and submit their sexuality to god um mm. but it's still an option and so it's not just celibacy but there's a sacrifice as gay, gay people we have to give that i think is in some ways more than right. just a heterosexual person. Well, that's that's exactly what I was um, going to add and, and do a follow-up question on. If I'm honest, and I've had many gay friends and had opportunities to share the gospel and and to talk about faith, and, and it was great to hear you say before that you'd 
all your gay friends are open and interested in the gospel. I've found that to be yeah, true. Amazing. I'm sure many here have. And But if I'm honest, I always have this fear when I'm talking yeah. to somebody, th- uh, thinking about that dying to self that you talked about, that that this would mean for them. And uh, it's not my job to fix that, but I just, I'm thinking, wow, if this person comes to Jesus, what they're going to have to sacrifice, and I, it, the point you just made, is bigger in most cases than what a heterosexual person would. Now, I, I think you've made a really important point, which is, and I, you said, all Christians, the, sh- you know, the, I forgot the word you used, but c- celibacy is the, default the default thank you the default Mm -hmm. so i think you you and many people who have gone through this walk are teaching us something that has not been talked about in the church the Mm -hmm. the importance of being single and the amazing Mm -hmm. life that we can live as single people so i hear that but how can i help a gay Mm -hmm. christian a gay person becoming a christian knowing that they are most likely going to go through some really challenging times. There's going to be a lot of self-denial and it's going to be hard. How can I help? It feels like almost like, oh, it's hard to tell them, come to Jesus. And then how can I help them then after that? That's a great question, Luke. I think personally, you have to hold the discontinuity and continuity of being heterosexual and gay together constantly and not try to say, oh, we're all like each other completely, but not like, oh, you're so different that there's no way that our common humanity can speak into each other's situations. And like holding the discontinuity and the continuity together and not ever letting them that be compromised. Um, I think that's really important. And then the second thing is I always say that like homosexuality is not a discipleship issue, sorry, is not an evangelistic issue. Mm-hmm. It's a discipleship issue mm-hmm. and you can't get to discipleship until you've experienced the gospel and you've experienced the love of God. But I think Christians try to rush over evangelism. Sometimes someone just needs to know that they're justified by faith, that they're included, that no matter what God accepts them, that his love will run after them, that, you know, like they're completely evangelized and they really understand the gospel that we, you know, all of us fell short okay. for now no constraint in christ like we're one humanity god has like saved us you know that they need to know the gospel know they're embraced know the kind of radical grace message of paul and like all of that stuff that frees them and then they can give their sexuality as a gift like mm-hmm. they don't feel moralized into being forced but they want to give that out of love for the God they've encountered. And that's a very different thing. And I, I really think that I feel moralized into becoming celibate is really dangerous, really wrong. Mm-hmm. The same with marriage. Who wants to be moralized into marriage? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I know a lot of pastors' kids that feel like they have to get married to please their parents. It's really mm-hmm. gross. Um, not just pastors' kids, but particularly pastors' kids feel that because they don't want to disappoint their parents. But then I find out they get divorced a year later and like, you know, because they're not like let's slow down let's be patient let's experience god's love let's let him lead us into a beautiful vocation of self-gift that is not forced or done by some of a compulsion other than the love of god and i think that's the place out of which god is pleased with us and loves us giving up crazy things for him and we're always called to give up crazy things for him so that I think we just have to caveat that discipleship within a revelation of the love of God and within eternal life, that this is not some short little life. Uh, sorry, this is not just some like thing that's going to be done forever, but it's a short moment where we get to worship Jesus in a special way, whether that's being a celibate gay Christian or marrying hmm. you know, someone of the opposite sex, which is totally counterintuitive or whatever it is, you know, with that special gift of grace. So that's my answer. It's just not easy. It's tough. I think just some days letting a gay Christian be like, I hate all of this and everything's bad and why? And not trying to <laughs> solve it and just be like, I know, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't explain why we're here, but we are. And Jesus will have better days and lead us into good days. And some days yeah. are just hard. 
and you just stop part of being a Christian. Yeah. yeah. I think I know your answer because of the way you framed uh, the, the, the whole concept here to help us understand more deeply. But a few people have asked this, yeah. um, George Kiroga, Anna Patterson, they're asking, um, how would you describe, there's often been a debate, um, are you born gay? And, and, and so there's been debates backwards and forwards on that. Can you share your, your view and understanding of this? Um, you've described it as an identity, so that's why I say it sounds like you've answered it. But can you talk and sure. speak into that? Are you born gay? Is, is, and is that always the case? Yeah, I try to touch on this in my talk. Um, but I don't think it's true that anyone's born gay, but I don't think it's true that anyone chooses to be gay. And that's what science actually seems to lead us to. Okay. Is that being gay and why you're gay and the origins of that are incredibly complex. I think there are kind of two ways. One is that you are actually gay, that you are just attracted exclusively to the same sex. And then there's another scenario where you might have experienced some kind of trauma with the, the opposite sex, but you know yourself to be attracted to the opposite sex. Um, but you, in that trauma, you've decided I can't, I just, it reminds me of something horrendous. I mean, I've seen male Christian leaders in my life massively fail me, female ones too, but like particularly male ones. And I have had two or three weeks where it's like, I hate men. I just hate them. <laughs> I have one, like, what the freak is wrong with men? You know, and just kind of raging against men and I'm like okay like that's not gonna solve the problem but it's like sometimes people have just been so hurt that they can't and so their like temptation is to just go and experiment with the same sex I don't think that's being gay I think that's a different situation okay um uh and then there are people in kind of in between you're kind of like bisexual and you have to be careful with people who are bisexual because it, it can be quite hard for them if they fall like head over heels for same sex, like the same sex, and they don't feel like they want to be with an opposite sex partner. But I, I still think, you know, then you have to give that up. And I think that can be really hard. I don't think it's the same as being gay, where it's like, the, the chances are slimmer that you're going to ever be married. But it is still hard for bisexual people to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my kind of answer is like, yep. it's, it's complicated. And human sexuality is complicated and you're not born gay, but you don't choose to be. And I think being gay is a complex um, combination of the created good, the full, you know, all together. And ultimately though, I think being a desirous creature is a gift, whatever it is, even if it's broken and fallen, it's still a gift to have desires. And God wants us not to have weaker desires, but have stronger desires just in the right direction. And so the grace of God has to break into our desires and reorient them to different horizons. And that's what has to happen, whether you're gay or straight. And that's going to look a bit different and have other areas of sacrifice, you know, as we've talked about. Yeah. David, I have a question. So obviously we can, we can talk about this from the perspective of someone that's, that is gay or, or, you know, experience this themselves. But the truth is sexuality and, gay rights and transgender movement, all this, this is a cultural issue beyond people that are personally experience it, right? And, and so it's something that I'm talking to someone that's not a gay person, but it comes up in my ability to share the gospel with them, right? Like it becomes a barrier for them. Yeah. Um, a lot of us deal with that when we're talking to people, it's expressing a lot of things you were saying, but they themselves aren't necessarily experiencing, you know, gay attractions, whatever. Um, so my question to you is, you know, a lot of times sexuality is seen as a justice issue today, similar to that of racism. And, and a lot of Christians are actually accused of being on the wrong side of history, right? So we'll, we'll correlate Christians that were racist and we'll say, you're, you're the modern version of that. How do, how do we respond to that? That's a tough one. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think I think I come back to suffering. I think that there's a way in which gay people and people, as I've talked about, of different ethnicities. I mean, it's not just that. It's like solidarity. It's not the same. You can't ever equate those things. I don't think you can ever equate everything. Everything's unique. And you can't say, 
what a black person's gone through in racism is the same as what a gay person's gone through with homophobia or that being gay is easier than being black or being black is easier than being gay. Like, let's just forget that. <laughs> um, and I think we're tempted to do that. I think early on when I was kind of celibate and I like had these revelations about the biblical perspective, I was a little bit like, this is harder than everything else and no one understands. And like, you know, and, but I really think they're unique and yet there's an overlap of solidarity that I do feel to some degree with people who've gone through racism. I, I, and so I think we're tempted to say, well, you know, homophobia is not as bad as racism. It's like, no, they're equally as bad as each other. I just think they're different states and they have a different theological meaning and it's just wrong to equate them into a narrative of liberation in the exact same way. And I think that betrays what they are. And so for, for me, it's like definitely about, again, holding that discontinuity continuity line with these questions. Mm -hmm. um, where do they overlap? Where they you know, That's kind of a complex question, but we need to hold that line. And then for me, the other thing is that there is a way I think that gay people have a special gift to give God and everyone seems to want to deny that that's heterosexual and I just don't understand why because heterosexuals have a special gift like it's like let's just it's okay we all have different gifts like what would be a source of suffering in Jesus becomes a gift and I'm actually grateful for the LGBTQI plus movement because and gay rights movement, because I wouldn't be able to be free to make that decision to give my sexuality and celibacy to God if it wasn't for that. If there wasn't the whole movement for gay rights, if there wasn't this liberation of some kind to actually make a free choice. And I value that. I just think the better choice is to give everything to Jesus. And that's what we're preaching. Whatever it looks like, he's worthy. <laughs> um, and so for me, I'm just grateful that I have the gay right to be celibate. And I'm grateful for it to the gay rights movement. I'm also incredibly angry at how something that was meant to free me and give me the right to choose how I wanted to live is now trying to close that down and say, I can't be a celibate gay Christian, that I have to be somehow ashamed of that. I mean, I'm queerer than the queer. Being celibate and gay is weird. It's queer. It's mm. like the queerest thing you could even imagine you know <laughs> maybe right. there's other things but like it's pretty like if you want to get anti-normal normal anti-normative anti-heteronormative be a gay celibate right. you know like there's like and I think what we did as the church is we elevated marriage and said we've got it and we've won and we've got won this culture war and then the gay community said well we're going to take that idol off you and I'm going to worship it just as much as you that's a pretty yeah. horrible picture that's not Jesus it's not the gospel and so the culture war has to be something that we deconstruct mm. and that we like, yeah. So that, there's some thoughts to help with that I, question. I think, I think that, yeah, go on, Luke. Well, just taking that lead you just gave, the deconstruction of the cultural war, I think part of it, especially for us as Christians, as a church, is we don't know the LGBTQI community and we don't understand their way mm -hmm. of thinking their questions and doubts. Some some of us do spend time with them, but in general, we don't. We know so little and understand so little what their questions are, their hopes, their goals. We just see the one thing: their goal is to be anti-Christian and to destroy our values. Um, can you help us get more of a heart for this community by maybe explaining how? How would you describe th this community? Their, their desires, their hearts, their question, you know, give us a bit of the heart of the LGBTQI community. Yeah, I think the LGBTQI plus community is just often trying to live authentically, trying to not reject themselves and to try to like fill in the void of that mystery and live a life that's kind of a bit more certain and pointed and like, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to get married. I'm going to, you know, if I'm transgender or have gender dysphoria, I'm going to go through sex reassignment surgery because I just want this to be reconciled and like, let's move on. And I think like 
you can kind of appreciate the bravery in that, you know, of that desire to have things settled and finally just live a semi-normal, whatever that looks like, human life. And you think, gosh, well, I have to at least admire something in that. And, I, you know, the other thing is we often look at gay relationships like there's some hellish, gross, disgusting thing as Christians. It's like there's a lot of good in gay relationships. There's a lot of things in certain gay marriages that you would want to, like, say, wow, like, you guys do love each other and you have some sense of love. It might, you know, in my opinion, it's not it's not honoring the created order that God brought in the beginning, but that doesn't mean there isn't like genuine affection or things that God might actually value in that relationship. And I found the way that God deals with gay marriages and gay relationships is often way more deep and appreciative (laughs) than we might think. And then he leads those people into various different kinds of pastoral choices. Like Sometimes they might break up. Sometimes they might have kids that they're raising and they decide they're going to remain platonic friends and raise the kids. Like there's just so much. And you just see this beautiful hearts. You know, you also see in the suffering of the AIDS crisis, you know, when I was in, you know, the the incredible community that built of solidarity. I mean, it was like a church. I mean, some ways it had more love than the church did. And like, we can learn so much about love and suffering from the gay community and as the church we want to be like yeah we get that we know what it's like to be persecuted and treated these ways and like you look at turkey the gay community and the church are like best friends because they will both get persecuted <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and like, i think that people showed up in other places in the bible as much and then you also have like Um, the Holocaust you know I my book there's a chapter where I met a Holocaust survivor the last gay Holocaust survivor and he talked about what the Germans the German Nazis did to um, you know hundreds of thousands of gay people and 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 he was like the the last living person who'd gone through that and being in that room with him and the Holy Spirit being like I am against this you know this I adopt gay people I love gay people I want gay people you know (laughs) um almost rebuking me for being overly conservative and overly like I don't want to identify as gay I don't want to have anything to do with this I just want to go be a Christian like there's something deep here that it's interesting in world injustice when we see like like Nazi Germany what are the groups that the devil goes after it's gay people it's Jewish people it's minority groups like we as Christians are the ones who are meant to be right out there, close and personal with those groups, fighting for justice um, and, and pushing this back, you know, this horrible thing, you know, this oppression. So I think looking at those historical things and really learning from them can help us be better and more Christ-like type and hold the line of having a difference of opinion about, you know, ethics, but loving and fighting for justice for people. Um, and, and, and living in that tension. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, I think a challenge is that tension. Um, and I think what you've been so well articulating is the compassion for people. And of course, compassion is literally to suffer with someone. And so to have the compassion, but how do we not allow that compassion to then erode our biblical truth? And I think you've spoken of that tension consistently. I think there's a, there's a natural tendency to say, okay, so are we just let people live their lives? Cause it's cool. Or so can you speak to that tension for one? I think that's a a one where a lot of people are asking. I think it's a very tough tension because some people believe that it's the ethic the church has that produces the harm, but I'm quite convinced it's not our ethic. It's not that we believe marriage is between a man and a woman and procreation alone for that and sex alone for that context. But it's that um, the way that ethic has been applied has been harmful. So it's, it's, it's looking at that. And it's really interesting when you look at the statistics, you know, in the Marin foundation survey, they looked, they, they surveyed all these gay people back. I think it was in 2007 or something like that. And they asked them, why was it that you left the church? And, you know, something like 90% to go and look at it, but 90% said, well, 
it's because there was no love. And only like 7% said it's because of the teaching on marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no love is the continual re reporting of the gay community, um, a lack of compassion. And I think there are really complex reasons that we struggle to give that compassion. I mean, I've struggled with it in my own ministry. I've had Jesus come to me and say, without compassion, there is no salvation. Like if your heart is not broken for people, then I'm not pouring out my spirit. Forget about it. <laughs> like, mm. I don't, this is, I'm not into platforms. I'm not into like slick Christian things. Like I want your heart to break. I want you to take risks for people. I want you to be willing to be judged because you went over and loved that person that everyone else thinks is a sinner. You know, I want being aware of that ourselves and crucifying the flesh um, way that the biblical together is what we have to do, what Jesus did. And he always oh, sounds like we're hmm. losing connection here. Mm -hmm. See, if, we'll give it a few seconds to see if it comes yeah. back, but it, we're about time to wrap up anyway. Yeah, I do hope, do hope his Wi-Fi can pick up again and get David back. This has been amazing, hasn't it? It's yeah, it's so it's powerful. it's such a challenging and in some ways like uncomfortable conversation that we need to have mm. to wrestle with it. I think that in the church, we need to be talking about this because right. it's the world is, and we can either leave it to the world or we can bring the biblical perspective into this. So uh, yeah. I, and maybe and, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. Um, I think the thing that's spoke to me and I think speaks to all of us mm -hmm. is that Jesus calls all of us, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what, you know, th sins we struggle with. He calls all of us to die to ourselves, you know, to pick up the cross mm. um, and follow him. And so I, I, I think that that is a call to all of us and that that gives us a place of humility to see others with compassion and then yet speak the truth in that context. And David has so perfectly articulated that from the context yeah. and it, his context. And it's not been easy. Oh, you're back, David. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hey, yeah. thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Amen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just quickly. So there's this one bit of, to answer your question, I think we also need radical um, identification and radical, um, radical differentiation. And so just quickly, the woman at the well, you see the Samaritan woman, there's a radical differentiation where Jesus says, no, actually, that's the wrong mountain that you worship, try to worship God on. That's not the right mountain. The mountain's in Jerusalem. I'm a Jew. It's right. Like, Israel is the chosen people. <laughs> like, you're not doing it right. <laughs> he doesn't compromise that. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, gay marriage is great and you can go do whatever you like. No. But he does say here i know what it's like to be human and i know you've gone through these relationships and he yeah. radically identifies with her humanity and gives her yeah. prophetic word and like ministers to her and like really in no way puts himself above her you know other than the fact he's the messiah like he doesn't it's just such a fascinating like radical identification radical differentiation mm -hmm. at the same time um, we see this time and time again with God, like radical holiness, transcendent from us, like where he's nothing like us, holy is completely other, and yet he becomes incarnate as a human being. Like these are the ways we have to hold truth and grace together. Yeah. David, um, I mean, I wanted to say also to the, you know, to our audience, you guys have sent some great questions. We've tried bringing as many of them in as possible, yeah. um, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But I was wondering, David, if just as sort of an ending thing, um, f do you have a message for any from our audience who are themselves um, struggling with this, dealing with different questions around their sexuality, trying to figure out how to follow after God's calling in their lives and at the same time struggling with sexuality, any message that you could share with them? Yeah, I think my message is that your sexuality is a gift before it's 
a curse and that God has a plan and a way for you, but it's not going to look like what you think it will if you make your sexuality your ultimate identity. You have to let it go. You have to put it under Jesus and trust him with it and not just act on it how you desire, but let him in and let him direct you and he will not fail you. Um, The church might fail you. Other humans (laughs) might fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. And so you can put your anchor down in trusting him and he will lead you through. And like he said to me, all you have to do is hold on. All you have to do is hold on to my cloak you know and i will take you to where you need to go and it's a roller coaster and it's crazy and it's hard and it's painful and it's wonderful and it's full of glory and all the things but you get the honor to fellowship with jesus in a way that's special if you're gay because you're giving up something so ultimate that he did also on the cross and he gave up his sexuality and didn't have kids and a family in that exact way and you know, so you get to like in an intimacy with Jesus that's special. And straight people have that too that are celibate in a different way. It's not like, but it's special. I, I think it goes beyond words and it's not just celibacy, God may call you to marriage, but yeah, it's not about that ultimately. It's how can I honor, how can I make, give the lamb the worthiness for his suffering in my life? And I'm telling you, when you trust Jesus and give your sexuality to him, it worships him in a way that nothing else can. And this is a short life. Like we're gonna be gone in 50 years. And what is what matters is that, and that what will remain is that. And you can have a lifetime of sexuality, um, but it's not gonna remain. Love will remain, you know? And so, as I said at the beginning, what is love? It's that love of the cross that you give back to Jesus that will remain. Um, and love can be in a romantic relationship. I'm not saying it's not, but often romance can be more of a distraction than a help. <laughs> and we have to learn to, we don't become non-romantic creatures just because we're not finding ways of channeling that towards friendship and intimacy in, in the church. So I want to encourage you. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but it's the best and deepest way to live. And it brings you the most joy. Awesome. 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 David, honestly, this, this has been so good. So good. Thank you. It's such and a so pleasure. Relevant. And we would love to do more of this stuff with you because I think the world and the church, we need this. And you have a unique thank authority you. that we need. So thank you so much we it's so good hopefully this is just the beginning of our relationship with you and so so blessed so thank Mm -hmm. you david thank you so much thank you guys i really appreciate it and i would love to help with more questions or please keep asking the questions i don't have all the answers but um it's maybe we can do another just straight q a session sometime yeah that would be awesome yeah we'll talk let's talk david because (laughs) clearly this is just the beginning well exactly expect a follow-up call from us or email to talk (laughs) about more we'll be sending you a a contract to see if we can convince you to do more stuff with us (laughs) hey i would love that it's been awesome i love what you're doing and 100 percent behind you thank you so much cool all right Thanks, David. Thanks, All right, we'll let David go and wrap it up here. Before you log off, um, we are going to have a, a, a debrief. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions and conversations that you want to have about what we just discussed. We're going to have a debrief in your region and in your language, which is, of course, helpful for that. Uh, and we're going to be talking about other ways to connect, to reach the global youth culture in your city. Um, so um, in the chat, there's a little um, downloadable PDF. Click that. Uh, and there is a link to a, uh, a group that you, you, for your region. We're going to, in two minutes, we're going to go into these groups. So this is your opportunity to talk, to debrief. And, uh, and then we'll also talk about specific ways that you can be involved. So Luke, anything you want to say to wrap us up? No, just I've been really impacted today. Um, the debrief session, we can talk about anything from the whole event so far. Tomorrow is our last day um, and it's going to be excellent. It's going to be yep. putting this it all into practice. The theme is how do we talk to real people about all these things we've discussed last weekend, this weekend. 
Um, we'll have John Stackhouse, who wrote a book called Humble Apologetics, and Lucas Ruger, who you guys have seen co-hosting with us here based in Beirut, Lebanon. So don't miss tomorrow. It's going to be how do we apply this. In this meeting that we're going to have right now, do stay on. It's not going to be yep. long. It'll be yep. like 20, 30 minutes. We'll hear a bit from you guys. We'll let you know more of how you can stay in touch with us as well. So stay. Yep. yep. So again, check out the PDF. And I also put a link to a Google sheet that you can literally click. Go right now and go into that um, small group session. Um, that's the end of our session today. Man. So good, so challenging, a lot of things to wrestle with, um, but God is definitely moving through this. So, so thankful for David. So go ahead, everyone. We love you. See you tomorrow, same time, same channel. And we'll be talking about how to apply this in talking to real people. Love you all. Go ahead now to the, to the small group discussion and Friendship Church, I'll see you soon.